Welcome to the Living Artist Podcast. I'm your host, Preston M. Smith. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Living Artist Podcast. I'm Preston M. Smith, at PMS Artwork Everywhere on Internet Land and Socials. I want to thank you for landing on this podcast. Whether you're a professional artist, just getting started in the art world, a collector of art, or just consider yourself a creative person, this podcast has something for you. I like to think of it as a fun way to rant and talk to other creative people about living the life of an artist, surviving and getting ahead in the art world, and enjoying your life. But most importantly, not waiting until you're dead to make it happen. All right, let's get started. Want to make a podcast? Spotify has got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere, and even earn money, all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then, you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify as well as Q&A polls to take conversations with your fans to the next level. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. I'm personally getting a lot out of Spotify for Podcasters, and I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com forward slash podcasters to get started. Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? Doing okay. Awesome. Thank you for being on time. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> it are is rare. Not on time? Really? <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, are you uh, are you back in San Fran? I saw with my social media stalking that you were in Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> I was in Taiwan. Um, yeah, I got back on the thirtieth, so I've been back for a little over a week, and it was so nice. Was oh, I'm really sure. Nice. Yeah. What What were you going there for? Just out of curiosity. For family, my I have three little kids, uh-huh. um, and their dad is Taiwanese American, and he grew up going to Taiwan in the summertime growing up, and wants our kids to have the same experience. But I took them solo. We're divorced, so I took them solo, and oh, okay, like solo here we trip. go. <laughs> Let's see how it, goes. <laughs> it was so much fun that we had the best time. Ate oh, our way amazing. to Taipei. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Yeah, you could just have like a foodie trip, right? Exactly, exactly. Well, thank you for coming on the podcast. We are here with Kelly Huang. Did I say your name right? You did. Oh, okay, great. Um, and this is the first time we're actually meeting, so it's it's nice to talk to you. Always excited to have people from the other end of the art world on the podcast. Kelly has quite the resume. I'm just going to tell people your accolades so you don't have to. Uh, you've <laughs> sure. been... You've been an art advisor for, if I'm butchering this name, let me know, Slot Buell and Associates. Yep, that's right. At art advisor for KCH Advisory, which you also founded. Uh, you were the co-director of Gagosian Gallery San Francisco. You're currently chief curator for Archive, and you're a VIP representative for Art Basel in San Francisco. I am. That's All amazing. Those All yeah. those things. And All much things. more, as we're going to learn. <laughs> Well, that's um, that's amazing. And I just wanted to kind of start off with how you got interested in art. We always do a little origin story here. You can start as early as you want, but just start us off with how you got interested in art in the first place and then take us through your journey a bit, if you can. Yeah, of course. Um, I guess I'll start off by saying my career focus, because you did list off all those wonderful things that I do. Um, <laughs> my career focus has been really on making art more accessible to more people. Um, yes. For me... Art brought me into a world of people who were deeply interested in abstract ideas and aesthetics, dialogue, and it expanded my understanding of the world and of people. And I like to say, because it's true, that it changed the course of my life. Um, it's why I've been dedicated in my career to bringing more people into it. I grew up in Indiana without access to contemporary art. Yeah, And it wasn't until I lived in Washington, D.C. after my undergraduate experience um, when I was working as a photo editor for the Atlantic magazine that I discovered contemporary art. And that was through visiting the Hirshhorn Museum. It was through then and exploring galleries locally in D.C. Mm -hmm. Um, And then eventually 
you know, realizing that, you know, this is something that I was really interested in. Where can I see more? And, you know, New York was close by. I started taking the train or, or driving up to New York and mm-hmm. going to the museums there, to MoMA, to the Brooklyn Museum, going to the galleries in Chelsea. And that really just opened up my eyes to not just the art, but also the art world community and the types of conversations that would happen there. What so, age were you at this point? I was... Oh. 21. 21, okay. 21. So I was just freshly out of undergrad and, um, you know, which is late in life for a lot of people in the art world to be discovering the art world. <laughs> yeah. Like a lot of people in the art world kind of grow up with art, whether they come from collecting families or they just were growing up in more metropolitan areas where they had access, you know, they're in LA or New York or somewhere in Europe or whatever it might be. Parent um, was an artist, maybe. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, you know, without having any of that type of exposure earlier in my life, it didn't, it took until I was 21 to really have those experiences. And, you know, I'd always been interested in digital culture. It was what I focused on in my studies and, you know, looking at visual culture and what kind of impact that might have on our human behavior, our values, etc. And so it mm-hmm. felt very natural to then like, look at art and see how artists make us question things around us, how art can challenge us and also just, you know, introduce us to beauty, you know, and like interrogating what that meant and why that was relevant or why it made us feel a certain way. And so, you know, given I was always kind of a nerd, you know, like (laughs) I love the academic and I felt like the art world was a place in which I could have these types of conversations with people and that they, wanted to engage in that yeah. um, with me. So, you know, for me, it was, that was a huge turning point in my life and which then prompted me to go back, get my master's degree in Chicago at the Art Institute. And that became the career switch. That was the moment. That's a great school. Yeah. I have a friend, yeah. uh, Joy Ray, who was just taking a course there and yeah. have friends from Chicago. But um, did you, I'm curious, did you take any art classes also, or was it on the other end? Yeah. Uh, I mean, when I was doing my undergraduate studies, I had a double major in cultural studies and media studies, and then studio art was my minor, actually. Oh, cool. Yeah. So, you know, I was making, but I was actually more focused back then on what I, what I knew, which was you know, more commercial, like Mm -hmm. graphic design, advertising. And so I was more concerned with like making in that realm. I'm not good at making like drawing. I can't draw. (laughs) (laughs) There's plenty of artists who can draw who also uh, do art. So that's true. This is true. Absolutely. But like I, but I do think that I lack ability to be so vulnerable in making, you know, I really admire that in artists. Um, It's something that I, I know I, I, can't do or, or it's more much more difficult for me to do but i love supporting artists obviously um, that's amazing well yeah. also well just speaking from the artist perspective and for i will just speak for artists here we also yeah. admire what you do and that's a different <laughs> type of vulnerability that i think a lot of us wish we had as artists too right yeah yeah, yeah. but yeah going back to your question so an undergrad i i did my minor in studio art and then when i was in dc and kind of inspired by what I was seeing and discovering, I started taking courses in art history. Um, Mm -hmm. So uh, University of Illinois actually hosted a program at the Phillips Museum in DC. And uh, the woman who was running that at the time was Suzanne Hudson, who's a wonderful art historian who's based in LA. You might know her. And she, you know, she was actually relatively young at the time too. I don't think we're that far apart in age. And She taught me so much, you know, she's really, she was the one who brought me to New York for the first time and, you know, introduced me to what was happening at the museums there, introduced me to some of the key galleries in Chelsea. So, you know, she was a big part of opening up my eyes to what the art world was. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Would you consider her kind of a mentor of, of sorts? Yeah. You know, she was definitely influential. Absolutely. And I'm still close with her. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. So take us from from this part of your life into doing like art advisory and on to yeah. starting your company and everything. 
Sure. So, you know, when I was getting my master's in Chicago, I did my master's in arts administration and policy. And but I was really interested in curatorial work. And so I um, I wanted to explore sort of what all the avenues might be for somebody like me in the art world. Um, I ended up working at a commercial gallery in Chicago, and then I ended up working as the uh, interim director at Gallery 400, which is the university gallery for the University of Illinois in Chicago, which was a great experience in curating and managing a team. And then I I think most formatively probably is that I took on a position as a curatorial assistant at the Renaissance Society, which is at the University of Chicago. Oh, um, cool. Yeah, that was when Suzanne Gaz was the director and Hamza Walker was there. Hamza, you might know from LA. Yeah. Um, he's now the director at LAX Art. But It is an incredible institution with a really long history and a very specific kind of curatorial approach. And Mm -hmm. so I definitely consider Susanna Hamza to be mentors. Yeah. Especially in that on that side of my life as a curator. You know, their perspective on what the role is of the curator is what I have ascribed to as well, which is really about getting to know an artist very intimately in their practice, you know, understanding what is driving them, what is it that they're trying to communicate through their work, and as the curator, being the one to help figure out how to frame their practice, how to present their practice in a way that allows more engagement by more yeah. people, you know, and it's That's really, important. yeah, it, it kind of helps to frame, frame their work in a way that makes it accessible to people or, you know, helps deepen the understanding of their practice. And so that's really my approach to curating as well. And I yeah. really kept that in my heart. Uh, was there a moment or like a show or a person that you'd spoke to that was like, ah, I think I can do this. This is something <laughs> I want to do. Or was it more just kind of organic, it just a process? I guess it was quite organic. I do remember a moment um, for sure. We, I was working with Hamza very closely on a group show called Several Silences. And the group shows are not what the Renaissance Society was known for at the time. You know, we did a group show maybe once a year, but otherwise it was solo exhibitions. And that's a very different, you know, process as a, with a curator and an artist. Um, I love the process for the group show because it was a ton of research. It was like there was an overarching theme. It was figuring out how these practices spoke to each other, et cetera. But I remember we had the opening for that. And after the opening, one of the artists who we were going to present in a solo exhibition was there to see the group show, but also to, you know, talk about what was coming up for his own exhibition at the Wren. And that was Mm -hmm. the artist Alan Sakula, who's passed now. But I remember sitting at, we had this big conference room, and I remember Suzanne, Alan, Hamza, and I sitting at that table. Suzanne invited me in to sit. And Suzanne was talking about how, you know, she was remembering what she saw the last time she visited Alan. We started talking about some of the ideas he was exploring, what that would mean to show this part of his practice versus another. What are the ideas? And it was just like this very kind of casual conversation about mm-hmm. him, his practice, the space, how people would react. And I was like, is this the curatorial process? <laughs> you know, like, this is amazing. I love this because it felt like it was so genuine in this like interest in knowing the artist in a in a real way, in a deep way. Yeah, it's intimate. And it was so intimate. And, you know, that was one of many, many, many conversations they would have leading up to the exhibition. You know, I think the exhibition was still like, over a year out at that point, but it was like oh, wow. this, this idea of a deep engagement with an artist, you know, not rushing the process, but really just like knowing how to have a relationship with them to get to know them in mm-hmm. that way so that you could be a curator in respect to his work, you know, with respect yeah. to the work. Yeah. Well, I thought sure that was really ch- powerful. Yeah. And that's, I'm sure it's very challenging because each artist is very different as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. <laughs> you got to find that little window in, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, you know, okay. so the process of like, you know, the Renaissance Society is definitely very formative in, in my thinking as a curator. Mm-hmm. Um, when I moved to San Francisco, I 
was looking originally for jobs at museums. I wanted to be a curator at a museum, but it was 2009 and the economy had crashed and none of the museums had a budget to hire. So it was a challenging time. And I was trying to figure out, okay, like, where do I fit in? What would I like to do? And when I was doing my master's, I had also been interested in art advising, but I thought that was something that I probably wouldn't do for another several years, maybe, Mm -hmm. um, because I wasn't sure how I could fit in at that point in my career. But as luck would have it, I, through meeting people here in the Bay Area art world, was connected to Mary Zlot, who is a legend when it comes to art advising. You know, I yeah. I knew who she was and her reputation. She's one of the most respected art advisors in the world. And she worked with really established collectors here in the Bay Area. And it felt like a dream job to take on and to learn from her. So she also, I would definitely count as a a strong mentor in my career. She taught me everything I know now about art advising, how to approach it in a way that is about curating, actually curating a collection about listening carefully to not, maybe not the artist in this case, because you're separated from the artist in a way, but really listening to your client, understanding what their concerns are, what, interests them, what drives them to be collecting? How do you tie together a collection that feels relevant? How do you encourage your clients to engage in the art world more broadly? You know, how can they have the power to support an institution um, in a meaningful way? How does that build community? You know, all of those things were really important in the way that she approached advising and that has influenced the way that I also approach advising today. And I spent 10 years there with her. Sorry, I want to interrupt you real quick because I I love to hear that because a lot of times you think, oh, these people are just, you know, making an investment and, you know, establishing, (laughs) like you watch shows like Billions, for example, and they're just buying this art and then they're just Uh storing it away. They never even look at the art. So I love that you're incorporating a passion for art on on both sides. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to interject. Yeah, no, no. I I think that's very true. There's many different types of art advisors out there and different approaches, for sure. sure. You know, what you see on Billions, that happens. That happens, definitely. Oh, yeah. (laughs) But yeah, I think because of my background, uh, more in curatorial practice and my desire to kind of focus in on those values, Mm -hmm. it led me to advising in in a very particular way as well. And so when I was there, I was advising both private clients and also helping to build a public art collection for the Dallas. Cowboys. And oh, wow. um, cool. I spent 10 years working alongside Mary on that project. And that included advising on building a really robust education program. It involved really focusing on how that art could be accessed by the public, how it can be engaged with in a meaningful way. How do we promote the art in a very public way and a very public platform? This was so, all to be uh, displayed in the stadium? Yeah, in the public areas of the stadium. Yeah. So yeah. outdoors and indoors, you know, it was thinking with the Jones family on how do we promote this collection? Why are we doing it? You know, how do we get it on national television during the Super Bowl when they hosted yeah. it? And, they, and then all of it happened. They built a really strong docent program. We, you know, published a really amazing catalog with Rizzoli. And we we also developed a audio guide for the collection that is still used today. And, you know, all of that was really beautiful and that like it, it meant more people could engage. Right. And like yeah. that knowing the, the public in Texas is a particular type of public that's like going to a football game. And it was Jean Jones's vision that you would have art alongside sport because she knew that not everybody going into that stadium was, interested in yeah. football necessarily but You're maybe they were kind spoon of feeding there, the art you know yeah. yeah and it's like well what if we also had something else that we are saying is valuable mm-hmm. um in the context of sport too and it makes it okay like that could impact somebody who's there and who doesn't necessarily want to be there for football and maybe yeah. you could even turn some sports lovers into art enthusiasts absolutely and then there is like yeah i mean even today there's so much enthusiasm for the art program there. There really is. Yeah. So that was really meaningful. Um, after I left Lot Buell, I went to Gagosian uh, to be the director in San Francisco. And it was... Sorry, but how did that happen? What was the connection there? <laughs> I think, you know, I've 
I was ready for something different. And mm-hmm. I wanted to have um, a deeper engagement with the Bay Area community in a broader way, in a more mm-hmm. public way. And I felt like that position gave me some power in that realm of like shaping what people in San Francisco got to see, not just my, you know, I don't know how many clients that I was working with at Slot Fuel, which was a very particular community, but like really the public of San Francisco, there was so much potential there and like, you know, giving them experiences. And, you know, San Francisco at that time and right now, it's the same. There's so much potential for people to engage in art. And yeah. it's a younger population here now, of, you know, these entrepreneurs who are here who want to figure out what, how to engage in the community and mm-hmm. being somebody from this Bay Area and figuring out what that means. And I wanted the arts to be part of that. And Gagosian being in San Francisco at the time was like, you know, it's a big deal for one of Huge the name. most international, biggest international gallery to say yeah. San Francisco is important. We want to have a presence there and we want to see what happens. And so, you know, going into that position, I was really excited about what that meant in terms of engagement with the public mm-hmm. and broadening appreciation and education for potential collectors. Did it? make any difference that it was close to the tech world too did you have any bleed over with that yeah i mean for sure i think i had a co-director charlie spaulding who grew up in san francisco knew a lot of the san francisco collectors who have been here for generations and then i kind of was coming in bringing in a lot of the younger collectors and younger potential collectors into the program so we complemented each other really well in, in terms of audience, you know, who yeah. we could draw in. Um, and we, so we focused together on who are the artists we felt from the Gagosian program who were going to be the most relevant to the Bay Area because of the you know type of work that they made, the conceptual concerns because of the aesthetics or because we wanted to give people here a little bit of an art education, you know, Gagosian's yeah. program can do that right? It's telling a a particular art history. And so how do we introduce people to that and, and make them see how relevant that is even Mm -hmm. now. And we hosted really fun programs to draw people in, you know, trying to, to expand what that audience could be. And so I remember this was fun. So we hosted a historic show of Man Ray's work, the surrealist, Mm -hmm. And we had all these sculptures in the gallery. We transformed it into looking like it was, you know, like 1920s red velvet curtains. And I love it. The films and like dramatic lighting. And so it became this really great experience in the gallery. But to complement that, we wanted to do something like a big public program. And we ended up inviting in Jim Jarmish's band, Squirrel. Oh um, yeah, awesome. <laughs> do you know them? Well, yeah. I know I know the director. He's one of my favorite yeah. directors, yeah. Exactly. You know, Jim Jarmish has such a cult following for his film. Yes. And he's an I'm amazing I'm a big Tom Waits guy too, so I love Tom Waits. Oh, yeah. Works with him. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Tom Waits. So he has a band called Squirrel and we invited them in because they had been doing these live accompaniments to Man Ray's iconic surrealist films. Oh, so awesome. Yeah, so we did a big concert with him, and I think actually Tom Waite was there. He came. <laughs> no way! Are you kidding? Yeah, me? Yeah, yeah. We had dinner together. Oh so wow, that's yeah. like on my bucket list to uh, <laughs> meet Tom Waite. So I'm very jealous. I wish we had met back then. I know, yeah, right? I could have invited <laughs> you to dinner. Tom Waite is here. <laughs> yeah, um, but you know, the concert attracts attracted hundreds of people, not yeah. just art collectors, not just the art community at all. It was film nerds people who yeah. really like followed him through that part of his practice and then music fans people who were into man ray for reasons outside of just like the traditional art world just like were you know really into surrealism or um knew the films particularly or whatever it might be it was just such a diverse audience a younger audience i would say but also you know mixing in people who had been following either jim or you know big fans of Man Ray for years. So Mm -hmm. it was great. It was a fun evening. It was like kind of, yeah, it was kind of everything we had hoped for in terms of like the type of community event that we could produce, you know, Mm -hmm. because Gagosian had the resources to, because we had the connections to be able to, to give that to the Bay Area community. That's so amazing. 
Yeah. I love that. <laughs> it was really fun. And having you know, that the, that name, the Gagosian name, I mean, that connects you with so many people too. It's probably one okay. of the best known galleries in the world, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely it is. Um, yeah. And for good reason, you know. And Gagosian decided to close the doors on their San Francisco gallery at the end of 2020. Um, yeah. And so at that point, I knew that I wanted to go back to advising. That was always the plan. And I started my own advisory, KCH advisory, at the end of 2020. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. And you're still, I know you're, we're going to get into archive as well, but you're still doing KCH, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's still like the core of what I do is my advisory. So I founded that at the end of 2020. And I mostly advise private clients, Mm -hmm. um, private collectors, but archive was one of my clients. You know, I did a little bit of institutional advising and one of those clients was Archive, and they brought me on as the curatorial strategy advisor at the beginning of 2021. There you go. Um, a little feather yeah. in the cap, as well as the uh, the VIP for uh, Art Basel. Yes, and, exactly. So keep going about your advisory. What what does that entail? What does your role look like <clears throat> there? And what does it look like to actually help build a collection for somebody and manage that? Yeah. Um, so oh, I, started my, no, I started my <laughs> advisory with... Um, this goal that I would help my clients find the crossover between their personal passion and art. And I think my foot, well, I know my focus has been on helping clients get started with collecting. That's really where my passion lies is in helping people understand that art can be really relevant in their lives, that it can really enrich their lives. And that really goes back to, what brought me into the art world to begin with as well. So I just want more people to have that experience. Yes. Um, most of my clients are young, you know, they're in their forties or mm-hmm. maybe early fifties. They have young children at home. A lot of them are thinking about how to bring art into their homes to live with and for it to be relevant to, you know, what they do, what they want to talk about with their kids. It's really a compliment in a way to their lives. So it's fun for me to, one, kind of give people the entree into the art world. You Mm -hmm. know, I think the art world can be quite intimidating for a lot of people. You don't know where to go the art. You don't know when someone's trying to dupe you. (laughs) You Yeah, right. A lot of things. And it's really quite opaque. So it's hard to know how to navigate it. And given my long time in the art world, I have a great network of people who I really have known and I've trusted for, you know, 15, almost 20 years. And I can bring that network of people and relationships to the benefit of my clients. So for me, it's, it's really fun bringing people in, showing them that it doesn't have to be an intimidating role, but actually it's a place where you get to have great, interesting conversations where you get to ask lots of questions. And that, that is the type of engagement that people in the art world, that galleries, the artists, they actually want you know they yeah. want people to be enthusiastic and curious and i think there's a lot of fear that you're going to ask a dumb question right absolutely like it's an elitist environment i think everybody has had that yeah. experience even as an artist as a curator as a collector going into a gallery feeling like oh wow i, I don't belong here so i love that you're doing that yeah because i do think that everybody can belong in the art world. They should, because that is what the art world is built on. It's built on ideas and questions and challenges. And like, if we need more people to be involved in those conversations to push the art world forward, you know, Mm -hmm. and the artists benefit from it, the curators benefit from it, the collectors do, we all do. So really that's my focus. And, you know, with the advisory, I am a full service advisory. So I help my clients not just purchase work and think about kind of overall curatorial strategy for their collections, but I also help manage the collections for them, mm-hmm. you know, which is important. I think in just like also teaching my clients that it's important to think about your role as a caretaker for your collection. Um, yes. So just so for that, anybody who doesn't know who hasn't really been a big collector what does that kind of collection management look like? Is it just taking care of the work? Is it storage? It is. It's all of those things. So it's, you know, storing the work in, in a professional storage environment for art, you know, climate controlled, um, yeah. secure storage if it needs to be stored. 
if you're living with the work, which hopefully you are, right. <laughs> um, making <laughs> sure ideal. that you're in, yeah, making sure that you're installing it in a way that protects the work, you know, making sure that works on paper are not installed in a place that's filled with too much light and definitely yes. away from direct light, you know, so that right. we're protecting the paper, you know, so thinking about the materials, the work and what those materials require, mm-hmm. you know, making sure that you have regular cleaning scheduled for your work or that it's if there's any damage that happens, helping my clients think through the next steps in conservation and, you know, allowing them to trust me with the the conservators that I work with to Mm -hmm. take care of it in a professional way. It also means fielding any requests for loans from museums um, to borrow works back for an exhibition and helping them, you know, coordinate getting the work to that museum and making sure that the work is well taken care of while it's away and then coming back to them in perfect condition as well. Right, right. Does it also entail, like, for example, if somebody wants to pass this along to their children, how Mm -hmm. they would go about doing that? Yeah, absolutely. With some estate planning, Mm -hmm. um, you know, questions come up there as well. Yeah, that's very cool. So from the curatorial perspective, as far as like choosing the work and helping people build their collection, do you have a group that kind of does that? What does that look like? I do all of that for my okay. clients and with my clients. Oh, you do um, it? I do it, yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, so I that is like the core of it. It's really the relationship that I've developed with each of my clients and mm-hmm. um, getting to know them, getting to know what their goals are and figuring out how we build a collection around those goals. So, you know, I do a lot of travel with my clients to go see art and you know, make presentations. We travel to go see things in person. We travel to go see museum exhibitions of artists that they're interested in or attend a Biennale so that they can get more exposure to artists. I really believe in looking at solo exhibitions, whether that's at a gallery or a museum, so mm-hmm. that my clients can have a deeper understanding of that artist practice before they jump into purchasing something. I do think that going to biennials is really important because I think that that is just yet another way of understanding how artists, different artists can speak to one another and what that means and, and how that might be relevant to the way that they're thinking about living with art and how those different artists works can relate within their own homes Mm. and within the context of their collections. Um, so, you know, I want that, I want art to be part of their lifestyle. You know, I want yeah. them to think, hey, if I'm taking a family vacation to Tokyo, what should I go and see while I'm in Tokyo? Yes. And it might be going to see a, a gallery exhibition. It might be going to see a museum exhibition. It could be going to see, you know, Hiroshi Sugimoto's project out um, by the bay. It could be mm-hmm. going to Naoshima Island and having that experience that, I want my clients to feel passionate enough about art to like want to experience it all the time for their enjoyment. Yeah. Well, all Japan is, is an art form in my opinion. I (laughs) love Japan. I love Japanese culture. I actually got turned on. I was a painter, but the, when I was in the Tokyo museum of modern art, I was looking at a Juan Moreau piece and I sat down in front of it for 45 minutes and I'd never had that experience before. The piece was literally vibrating. And I was, oh. I started getting all teary eyed and I was like, yep, yeah, this is, I, this is what I have to do. <laughs> so, so it was very amazing. impactful for me. But anyway, I, I just wanted to piggyback on what yeah. you said. That's great that you're spending that much time with your clients. Yeah. It's a I'm very sure intimate relationship, does. you know, because you're, I mean, the way that I, I approach advising, it is a very intimate relationship. You're really getting to know the person, you're getting yeah. to know their values. You're trying to help, you know, align that with the art that they're going to live with. Mm -hmm. And you're traveling with them and you're, you know, you're having a lot of experiences together. You're involved with their decision making, you know, as a couple and as often as a couple, but um, (laughs) it's, you know, you have a little very deep uh, engagement, a little therapist uh, element to it as well. (laughs) (laughs) Couples therapy. Sometimes, sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, Right. Yeah, definitely. (laughs) Whatever it requires. But I love it. That's amazing. Yeah, and I'm, you know, I'm very particular about who I work with as a result because I, I want to make sure that I'm working with people who share the same values, who want, you know, this very particular approach. There's a lot of art advisors out there, and I think it always really does come down to what that values alignment is and the chemistry. It's like if you're going to spend that kind of time together, you want to, you want to enjoy it. They want to enjoy it. You know, mm-hmm. it's like 
about bringing some element of joy into their lives. If anybody's interested in reaching out to you, how would they go about doing that for KCH advisory? Or is it like a referral basis? (laughs) Most of my clients come by referral, but Mm -hmm. anybody's welcome to reach out. Of course, they can email. Yeah. Info at kchadvisory.com. Okay. Okay, great. Well, if you don't mind, we can shift gears to archive unless you want to talk a little bit more about KCH. No, I think that's great. Okay. So tell us what uh, archive is, first of all, and then you can tell us a little (laughs) bit about your position there. Oh, sorry about that. Hold on. Oh, that's okay. Turn off those notifications. I I didn't hear anything, so. Oh, you didn't? (laughs) No, likely. Okay. There's like a loud thing on my side. Your Vermont day break. (laughs) My wife is Argentinian. She turned me on to this stuff a long time ago. Now I'm addicted. Oh, really? That's Mm -hmm. still a lot of caffeine, right? It's a lot of caffeine, but it is like kind of evenly (laughs) distributed. So yeah, it's like a slow release. (laughs) If you have anxiety, be careful. But anyway, sorry, good. (laughs) All right. So you asked me about archives. So um, archive is a new model for bringing in more voices into what is being deemed important by the art world Mm -hmm. and what is then as a result reflected in collection. And, you know, what really drew me into archive, well, maybe I'll back up a little bit. So I was introduced to Archive actually through a former Gagosian client of mine oh, at wow. the end of 2020. Mm-hmm. Um, this guy called me up and he said, hey, like I've gone through a, a bunch of changes. I've moved and now, you know, I'm focusing on projects having to do with blockchain, et cetera. And yeah. he had started, he had started a kind of like an incubator community for people who are coming from not from like the blockchain crypto world and then wanting to explore that world and like within this community yeah and within mm-hmm. that community he said you know there's this idea that's come up that has to do with the art world and museums in particular and mm-hmm. i think that it'd be amazing if you wanted to chat with this guy you know the ideas about making the art world feel like it belongs to the people. And he's like, you know, have you heard of a DAO before? No. <laughs> have, you heard, have you heard of blockchain? Yes, but yes. I'm very skeptical of like what all that means. Have yeah. you heard of NFTs? And I was like, I don't want anything to do with NFTs. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, yep. no, no, no. And he's like, well, listen, like I'm reaching out to you because you're one of the few people in the art world that, you know, I think he was a younger guy in tech and finance in the Bay Area. And he was like, you were one of the few people in the art world who really made me feel welcome, Mm. who made me feel like I could ask questions, who was curious. And so I think you're one of the the people I thought of who would be open-minded enough to just hear this person out and maybe help guide them a little, like, you know, help educate them on like how the art world functions and that might help him. And said, yeah, of course, like I'll have the conversation and let me, let me research all of this a little bit and really get an understanding of what a DAO is. That was the original concept, right? So I did. And Tom McLeod, the founder of Archive, and I met in the winter 20, early 2020 or early 2021. Mm -hmm. And we instantly hit it off in terms of like, just thinking about you know, what his goals were with Archive, which was really about this idea of how do I build a museum for the people, built by the people, you know? And I was like, for what is people. that? Yeah, for the people. And like, yeah. what does that mean to you? You know, and he said, I just feel like there's so many things that get locked away in storage at museums that people don't ever get to see. And, mm-hmm. you know, he had had an experience with a, a startup of his um, previously, that was a storage company of like you know, storing people's things. Like mm-hmm. it was, you know, if you wanted to store away your camping gear, somebody yeah. would come and pick it up and put it into storage. And oh, okay. and when you wanted it, you clicked on the app and they brought it back to you. Very cool. And he said that you know while he was running that startup, more and more interesting things started getting picked up from people's oh. homes. You know, collectibles yeah. and. Rembrandt etchings, you know, baseball card collections. And he was like, even like within private collections or people's things, 
they're interesting things. And it reveals a lot about people, you know, about how different people have different passions. And, Mm -hmm. you know, he had this belief that I share that everybody, everybody should be able to have an opinion, you know, and if they want to engage in a conversation about ideas, even if they don't have a professional background in it, they certainly should be able to ask questions and engage and contribute what they know to that conversation. And art should be that, you know, it should be that conduit for those types of conversations to happen amongst a diverse group of people. And, you know, given my goals of bringing more people in, I felt like, okay, well, there's clearly a values alignment here. Mm -hmm. Um, well, and can I say real quick that mm-hmm. once you look at a piece or let's say it's music, you listen to a piece of music, the ownership is in question, right? Like you're looking at it, whoever's viewing it, it becomes a, a part of their own experience. So whether they can actually formulate it in words, they do have something to say about the piece. So I love that you're kind of absolutely. giving somebody a voice or letting them have a forum where they can actually develop that voice. Yeah, absolutely. So then it really became, okay, we have a values alignment. He's like, you know, how do we get artist support, you know, and through this new idea of like having the public or the, the specific public, right, the membership of archive, have that voice, be able to express it, engage with the artist. And then in turn, by purchasing the work, we're supporting the artist financially. And then yeah. by then making this commitment to bringing that work then into the public sphere again, how are we creating a larger impact for that artist and educating more people about it and allowing more people to engage? So, you know, all of that lined up. I had lots of ideas based on my experiences in the art world and wanted to help them figure out the particularities of the art world and how to navigate it. You know, as Mm -hmm. you and I both know, it's tricky. You know, it it is an industry built on relationships and trust is a huge part of that. And, you know, there's certainly not a lot of trust for what's happening in tech within the art world, traditional (laughs) art world. And so, you know, I, in really believing in just the core values that we had aligned on, I knew that I would feel comfortable if I could be heavily involved that, Mm -hmm you know, we could do this the right way. Then. And it would benefit the artists. It would benefit a lot of people. It would benefit the members, you know, and yeah. broadening their experiences. I have a lot of I questions. Yeah. If you don't mind, there's uh well, first of all, I see, you know, you hear like democratizing art curation and that sounds right. But how does somebody go about getting on to being a part of the community here and what does it look like? Does it look like, for example, you find a piece of work, you acquire it, and then these people are coming in and curating the show? Or, or are you actually curating what is chosen to be acquired? Yeah. So I can walk you through kind of the process now. Mm-hmm. Um, because that was, you know, I, what I just told you is really like just laying the foundation for the idea. Yeah of archive in general. The way that this is manifested is that we we do have a curatorial team at archive. Um, I lead it. And then we have Simon Wu, who is uh, focused on contemporary art. And then Isabel Flower, who's focused on cultural artifacts and mm-hmm. pop culture. And as a team, what we're doing is we have uh, our archive membership, which is close to 2,000 members now. And we have different forums for people to engage in conversations. So that is currently through our Discord channel, but also through an app that our team has developed. We really see it as our role in like keeping tabs on what all those conversations are that are happening, right? Like mm-hmm. our mission right now is to serve our, our members um, as representatives of like public. So we're looking in. I'll give you an example. So for instance, we did an acquisition round, what we call it, Mm -hmm. with um, Gallup Forest Kim. And we're trying to mimic the the curatorial process at a traditional museum. So we are looking at the conversations happening. We are seeing that there's a lot of conversations around this idea of repatriation of objects and how antiquities are treated within an institution, how they come to be there, what kind of life do they live once they're in the institution, Um, diversity, you know, and what those histories are that we want to tell. And as we're looking at that, we're looking at 
contemporary artists whose practices speak to that. And also thinking about the concerns of archive of building a more diverse collection than a lot of traditional museums have built to date. And we looked at Gala Forest Kim, and she is a Korean Colombian artist mm-hmm. um, whose work really is about looking at those issues, at those very same issues. You know, she's looking at what lives these objects take on um, once they're a part of an institutional collection and making us ask those questions. And she's engaged with the institution as well as in the, the making of her own artwork. Mm. And so we're like, okay, that's like a perfect alignment of like the conversations that are happening, what people are wanting to talk about, engage with. And what our team then does is we curate a collection of works to be mm-hmm. included in an acquisition around that is dedicated to a single artist or maker. So in this case, uh, for Gallup or Kim. Okay. Um, and what we want to do there is we want to present our members with kind of the breadth of her practice. So we wanted to include works from three different series by Gala so that we could tell her story, you know, that our members could get a deeper understanding of who she is as an artist and then introduce the questions so that our community can engage. So that means our curatorial team is developing different essays and texts that describe her practice and the specific works that we're including in the round. Mm -hmm. And our team also develops an introductory video piece about the artist so that people have that type of mediated experience of seeing her work. Does Archive Um, also film this piece? Do they film the piece? Is that what you said? Yeah. Um, So our video production team is kind of stitching together existing video footage, documentation from the galleries, et cetera, in order Mm -hmm. to create that video piece. Um, And then we schedule a Zoom call, which is our curatorial call, where all of our members are invited to participate. And that's when our curatorial team will present the artists in depth. And then we often have either the artist or maker or an expert come on to do Q&A with the community directly um, on that call. Yeah. And that call gets recorded and that's available on our internal website. And that's where our members after the call go, they can spend more time with the text that we develop. They can read, you know, more in depth about each of those individual works and then they vote. Um, once they vote and that voting period is closed, we acquire the work that has the most votes. And then the second part of the process starts, which is in thinking about placement of that object back into the top public realm. That's amazing. So you are actually going with the votes from the public. We are. Cool. With our members. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So, and then uh, Archive actually has a a gallery space as well, right? Or or a show space or no? We do not. I was confused about that when I was on the site. Oh, no. Archive does not have, um, we do not have a physical space for Archive. And that is actually part of what we're trying to do is not be limited by our own space in the same way that a traditional museum is limited by the yeah. walls that they have available to display their collections. So for archive, it's really a, a museum without walls. <laughs> mm-hmm. So we think of ourselves almost like a lending institution where we're building a collection whose purpose is to live out in the public realm through different partnerships. So mm-hmm. At times, Archive will curate our own exhibitions of works from the collection or create opportunities. But on the other hand, it's also like, well, you know, there's XYZ Museum wants to borrow that work and put it in an exhibition. Let's make sure that that happens. Um, Let's pair up with other nonprofits or organizations that want to showcase that particular work to complement what they're doing. So we're working on various partnerships to bring the work into the public realm. And that can be, you know, that can look very different depending on what that organization is. Yeah. Uh, Does it include like art in public spaces? Does it include private collectors? Yeah. Yeah. All of the above. Uh, Not private collectors. Not private collectors. Okay. No. Like we're not going to let people borrow work from the collection to put into their homes. Yeah, but yeah. it's it's about putting it into the public realm. So that is museums, other nonprofit spaces that mm-hmm. having to do with arts or culture. It you know for kind of our pop culture items, it could be something like a 
lobby of a public institution like a or a company that's yeah. public where that object might be more relevant to them for example like the dallas cowboys yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. like if we had something that had to do with sport or you know like it yeah. could very well exist in a place like that yeah or a university maybe or something like that absolutely universities have been very interested in engaging with us so we've had i feel like the most engagement has been with universities nonprofit cultural organizations and you know museums yeah well that's awesome I'm curious, and for people listening, I'm sure they're curious how they could try to join the community if they wanted to. That is the easiest thing of all. So it is free <laughs> to be the, <laughs> it Perfect. is free to be a member of Archive. So you just need to go to our website, which is archive.net, A-R-K-I-V-E.net, mm-hmm. and click apply and you answer a few questions about you know what your interests are and um, and then our team reviews that. And then once you're in the community, then you get to participate in this whole process. Very cool. And then I have to ask the question because a lot of artists listen to this. Is there yeah. any way for artists to submit work to be potentially acquired? Yeah. Well, I would say with that, we, we're not taking unsolicited sort of material, but mm-hmm. what we do is we do have a lot of artists who are members of the archive community. Oh, so cool. I would have. Yeah. So I think if this is something you want to engage in, obviously not just for self-promotion, but just to be engaged in this type of community, apply to be a member. And we actually have a specific channel that is for artists to share their own work. And it has been one of the most vibrant parts of our community is like the artists engaging with each other and with the broader community and sharing things from the studio. We've done programs that highlight our members who are artists. And so we'll do a Zoom call. And those have been really well attended. It's been really fun. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So there's definitely opportunities to share. So long as the the intention really is to be part of a community. That's a great lesson. And that's something I talk about all the time on the podcast. I'm involved with a gallery here. They show my work, but I also do some curation and and we do some group exhibitions and stuff like that. And people are always trying to get in and and they wonder when they don't get in, why they didn't get in. And we're always telling them, show up, you know, be a part of the community, get to know people. And that's really a bridge into, uh, you know, having people know who you are and then developing the community and then keep submitting your work as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that's why we ask people to apply for membership, Um, Mm -hmm. not specifically for this example, but just in general, like we want to make sure that the people who are applying to be members are people who actually want to be part of the community, who want to, who believe in uh, what's driving us at archive, because the value in being a member is really in the conversations that take place. You know, this Mm -hmm. is why galleries who represent artists and sell the work to us are willing to do that is because I can show them the conversations that are happening and they're impressed. You know, they're like, oh, you know, somebody who's not part of the art world at all doesn't collect and maybe it's just like in the tech world. And they're yeah. asking incredibly insightful questions about the work of Josh Klein or a Lauren Calzadilla yeah, having no art history Josh. background. You know, yeah. it's like there's so many questions that come up with conceptual work like that. And you know, if we have members who are there just for self-promotion in any way, not, I'm not saying just artists who might be in the community, but, you know, it could be a lot of people who are like just, you know, shilling on their like tech startup or whatever it could be. (laughs) We want to make sure that that's not why people are there. And that's not how people are engaging with each other, that like they, they really are there to be part of this mission. Do not join Archive for self-promotion, please. <laughs> it's just not a good look for anybody, believe me. It's not a good uh, look. It's, it's not, not a good look. look. <laughs> um, go there for community. Go there to learn more about art. It sounds amazing. I, I do have to ask because we're talking, we've talked a couple of times about storing art and stuff like that. What happens to art that's not placed somewhere? I'm assuming since this Tom, his name's yeah. Tom, right? Yeah. Tom had a storage start it before this maybe some uh-huh. of that comes in handy for the art as like a little <laughs> intermediary <laughs> yeah he no longer has that company but oh, okay, um, okay. <laughs> no, but we work with we work with reputable art storage companies we okay. have a great partnership with Crozier, who you know is great in terms of art logistics and storage so works live in secure climate controlled storage until they are off to be on display somewhere in the world okay um 
and you know, it, it is something that we think a lot about. It's like, we, we want to make sure we were good caretakers and good stewards of the collection. And so it is about making sure that the opportunities that come up for public display of the art are one which the artwork or the object is going to be safe. You know, so yeah. we do have, we do have a list of requirements in order to be good stewards. You know, we want to make sure that there's security, that there's climate control, that there's all these considerations that you need to have in order to make sure that the work is protected yeah. um, and in good, in our good care, even when it's not with us. Definitely. And that's good to hear. Was Josh Klein, was that an artist that you specifically went for? I love Josh Klein. He's yeah. been uh, an artist that I have placed in my client's collections for mm-hmm. years now, who's practice I feel like is just so relevant to where we are today definitely relevant to our theme it actually wasn't my idea first I think it actually came from my team but I was happy that it came up it made a lot of sense when it did and I thought the timing would be perfect given that he has this big mid-career survey currently Mm -hmm. up at the Whitney Museum in New York you know his work has always been I feel like he's always been a little ahead of the curve you know and thinking just ahead of the curve though which is like why his work is so uncanny in some ways, but like he's dealing with the near future consequences. And sometimes it's really dire. <laughs> and like, yeah, makes us think about that, you know, because um, he was kind of an activist first, right? He was doing a lot of the Occupy Wall Street. I, I don't know. I'm actually not sure. I'm pretty sure I'm he was sure. involved with some of that stuff. But yeah, he's definitely got his yeah. finger on the pulse and is a little ahead. <laughs> so, he absolutely does. Yeah. 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 He's a great artist. He was actually... I don't think I mentioned this before, but I also, I founded something called the Gold Art Prize, which. Yes, I was going to get to that. Yeah. uh, yeah. So he was a finalist for our 2021 award. Um, I had known his work for years before then, but I was very happy when I saw he got nominated for that. I think he's one of the leading voices among AAPI artists Mm -hmm. working today. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit? I want to be mindful of your time. I know we're hitting an hour right now. What time do you have to get out of here? I have to get out of here pretty soon because I have to go to a gallery lunch. Okay. But yeah, five minutes. But I have a few more minutes. Five minutes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Well, we can talk about the Gold Art Prize or I can just ask you. We do just a couple of rapid fire personal questions at the end. You want to talk about the the Gold (laughs) Art Prize or do you want to do that? Oh my gosh. Um, They're not like hardcore. Let's talk about the gold art prize. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I am going to sneak one in though before you go. Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. So the gold art prize. Yeah. Tell us about it. Uh, I founded the gold art prize in the beginning of 2021 and along with a nonprofit called gold house. Mm-hmm. And this was really a time where you know, I had been wanting to find a way to support more engagement by the Asian American community, specifically in yeah. art, um, being in the Bay area and, a place where there are a lot of very successful Asian Americans, um, but not collecting (laughs) was really disheartening (laughs) in a way. Um, I, because I knew that if people were not engaged in art, they were not then on the board of the museum. They were not involved in the acquisitions committees. They were not involved in having a voice in the institutions, which then are setting the tone for what is included. And by what's included in a museum, you're also getting to be written into art history. You're getting to see that these are the relevant voices for everyone, not just for your particular community. And so I had originally been interested in figuring out how to get more people engaged in collecting. And then it became during the pandemic, the artists are really hurting and the yeah. artists are at the center of all this anyway. Like, let's find a way to support the artists so that we can actually support the entire community um and so partnering with trickle up economics trickle up (laughs) you know so it was really through centering the artists and gold house had encouraged an award and i said well i don't want to just do a list of artists and like you know publish it somewhere i think it has to be really meaningful and what's meaningful in the art world is for the artists to get sort of an endorsement from professionals in the field from curators especially and so you know I started to kind of outline what this process could be and how it could be meaningful to the artist and for me that meant creating a nominating committee that was all leading curators from the Asian diaspora it meant 
creating a selection committee then that would review those artists' works and they would be people who are collecting and on board of institutions. It was also about including from the Gold House side some of the Asian cultural leaders, um, mm -hmm. actors and actresses and fashion designers and so forth who were actively engaged in art and or had a passion for art, but also had a huge platform and were you know invested in activism and wanted to help promote. And so it became this really nice balance of people making those decisions. We also wanted to make sure that there was prize money involved because the artists, yes. you know, need that kind of support, especially Definitely. if they have more <laughs> experimental practices. And, mm -hmm. you know, in looking at Asian American practices or diasporic practices, a lot of those artists were making works that were not just paintings on the wall. Right. They were making performance-based works, installations, sculptures, you know, challenging work. And that is not so commercial. And those are the yeah. artists who need that type of um, unrestricted monetary support the most. Yeah, it's hard so, to monetize some of those things. Yeah, yeah. So we want to make sure that we were providing a significant little boost with the prize. So we do give five awards each cycle, $25,000 each. Yeah. Um, and in it's addition not a chump that, change. That's really nice. It's not chump change. You know, I wanted it to be enough to be like, okay, maybe we can cover studio rent <laughs> or yeah. maybe we can cover production for that next body of work that you're doing. And, Definitely. Um, you know, and it took a lot of figuring out like what is the right amount um, and how can we fundraise for it and make sure that we, we have it all covered. Yeah. Um, the other really significant part for, for us is to publish a catalog um, because there is such a lack of scholarship about Asian diasporic artists. Mm -hmm. And there just hasn't been that field of study, you know, um, no. and we want to make sure that there are opportunities for writers from that community to be writing about their own community. And, you know, the language of the art world is academic a lot of times. And so Definitely. let's figure out how to create those opportunities. So we publish a catalog for each award. It's a biennial award. So we are now in our 2023 cycle and we'll be announcing our awardees early this fall. That's awesome. Well, I think that's amazing you're doing that. Thank you for doing that. And, yeah, you know, it's just, it's something that's very rare in the world. So check out the Gold Art Prize, check out Archive, check out KCH Advisory, check out all those things. Check, <laughs> check out Kelly, Kelly Huang on, uh, on Instagram. You can see her globe trotting a little bit. But yeah. um, I'm going to ask you one last question, then I'll let you go. Uh, okay. I typically ask like biggest failure, superpower, all this stuff, daily routines. But I'm just going to ask you, can you give us some advice that you would give to your younger self? Looking back at any age, what you've learned and all your experience, what advice would you impart upon your younger self? Oh my gosh. What advice would I give my younger self? I think my advice would be to still just follow your passion because that's going to lead to success for you and it's going to lead to real impact for those outside of you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank I love you. that. Thank you so much, Kelly. You're a badass. We we love having you on the podcast and check out Kelly Huang and all the stuff she's doing. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you so much. This has been the Living Artist Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. I just want you to know that I appreciate you being here and I'm grateful to be in your ears. Your art and creative life on this planet is meaningful. So thank you for sharing it with me. If you like this podcast, whatever platform you're listening to it on, please subscribe and share it with your friends. You can also leave me a positive review to show your support. This helps me to reach more people with the algorithmic magic and keep the show going strong. If you want to see more of what I do and check out the art that I create, you can visit my website at www.pmsartwork.com or follow me on social media everywhere at PMSArtwork. That's it for now. See you back here next time.